Okay, Emily's going to tell us a little bit about the two dogs we have today. I know one, well, the spelling's over there, right? Some of you won't be able to see it. Go ahead, introduce them. Okay. So, Grace is the white dog, which she's been in class before. Um, and, and then Athena is the cow dog mix. She's walking around the back. Right? Okay, okay. now Grace is bilaterally deaf. Yes. Right? Grace is fully, mostly deaf. Lately, I've been she has been hearing some things, so I okay. don't know how extensively it actually goes right. for that. Um, I've had both of them about the same amount of time, about seven months now. I got Grace from a rescue, and I took Grace in from a friend where she was apparently having some aggression issues. Um, I have not seen any of those things happen since I've had her, so I've gotten her to start reading right back up into re-socialization and doing some um, work with dog play. And Grace wears that vest now when I walk around campus, so people know she's deaf because she can have some reactivity issues sometimes, so I want people to come up nice and slow and always ask permission to pet her. I got that as Christmas present from yeah. my family. That's neat, because you were telling us the last time she was here, don't like cover over her. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, the over stuff still her out a little bit. Okay, now, right. But, so. And then I, I missed where you got Athena. I took her in from um, a friend. Apparently she was having some aggression issues in their home. I'd known her for a few years before that, um, so I took her in, but I haven't had any. Okay, was she having people aggression issues? Uh, or? Uh, issues apparently, I haven't seen either of them manifest, and she's been living with me. Sometimes you can just be a little environmental stuff okay. going on, but okay. since she's in with me, I haven't had any issues okay. with her, and she's actually started coming out to my play groups now to um, okay. start re with the other dogs a little bit more. Okay, yeah. Well, so this is good for her to be with us, too, yes. to so see how some extra socialization to see today. how wonderful people are. Yes. Right. So, and she is six, and Grace is two years old now. Okay, so Athena is six years old. Yes. Okay. Wow. Here goes Okay, I've just got a little bit of setup to do here, and then watch my camera, kids. <laughs> I'll put that there. That might even help weight it down a little bit. What was I looking for? Oh, I know what I was looking for. Okay, well, today, let me tell you what we're doing. A week from today, we have an exam in Lily G126, that same place. We'll go down there. Uh, we'll have the same exam proctor. Okay, Stella. Okay, now guys, don't get too wild. So Emily, try to cool them down a little bit if they get wild. And I've got to do one thing. Uh, while I'm doing this, Katie, is Katie here over there? There's Katie. Uh, tell us what was in the news today about cats. <laughs> I don't read the news. <laughs> it was on TV. Do you know anything about it? Yeah. Anybody else? What was in the newspaper or the news this morning, especially on TV? I don't know if it's on the newspaper yet. Anybody help me on that? Yeah. Something about cats. Well, I'm looking up one thing. Nobody? Ethan, you're not even going to help me? I don't watch, watch TV. You don't watch TV. You're too busy studying. Okay. That's right. <laughs> well. That's a good thing, I guess. Was it about cats and like mental illness? Oh, there we go. Chris, tell us. That was Joe. I don't know. I didn't read the article. I just saw the headline. I don't love cats. Where did you see it? I don't love cats, so. It's on CNN. Did you? Oh, who? who's talking? Joe. Oh, Joe. I'm sorry. I thought it was Chris over here. Joe. Okay. You saw it in CNN. Okay, that's probably where I saw it. Okay, and we're going to come to that after we get done with pheromones. And the reason I'm hesitating here a little bit is I'm going to find our first presenter. And we're ready for a discussion on the Bruce effect. Remember, I'm your team member too, right? So you can point it if you want. <clears throat> Take it away. Okay. Um so, the Bruce effect um, was founded in 1959 by Hilda M. Bruce, mainly studied in laboratory mice, but has been um, studied in a lot of other species as well, as far as like, I think the most exotic one I saw was like the lion. Um, but basically what it is, is um, when a female terminates her own pregnancy. Um, and this is done because when rats mate, the female has an instinct in which she remembers the chemicals that make up the smell of her male partner. And it is, it happens in, um, it's the overall odor and as well as the um, urine that she remembers distinctly when they mate. 
And then when the female is exposed to an unknown, uncastrated male, the pheromones in the male's urine are what trigger a neuroendocrine pathway that inhibits the production of prolactin. Prolactin is the home hormone responsible for secreting progesterone, which is a hormone essential for fetal development. So basically, when sh the female uh, mouse interacts with a unknown male that wasn't the one that she mated with, that she could um, essentially terminate her own pregnancy. Um, and that's pretty much it. Okay, you brought up a great point. Tell me, so we because we have a test next Wednesday. So tell me that thing about the prolactin <coughs> progesterone pathway thing. Okay. Um, the pheromones in the male's urine are what trigger a neuroendocrine pathway that inhibits the production of prolactin. Okay, so your that strange male inhibits prolactin. Yes. Okay. And then prolactin is the hormone responsible for secreting progesterone, which is um, essential for fetal development. So without ultimately without prolactin, you can't secrete progesterone, and you can't um, the fetal won't develop. Okay, anybody have any questions on that? That sounds a little strange if you're not familiar with rodents. You know, usually in our large domestic animals, thank you, in our large domestic animals, prolactin is not really that connected to progesterone, but in rodents, it tends to like promote progesterone synthesis from the CLs, okay? So it's just a little weird on rodents. And if you ever study endocrinology in depth, the rodent stuff is just a little bit different. <laughs> Sorry while we dance here. Is a little different than uh, large domestic animals. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. So, so here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to go to the document cam, and you guys are going to help me fill out a table that summarizes these effects because you know last uh, on Monday we had certain effects and I want to get it all on the table so then when I make the test up I can look at my table and you guys all have the same table so let's do the Bruce effect and I'm just going to summarize to the right what it does now here's one last thing, and I remember Ethan and I were talking about this Monday after class. You know, we sit here and chit chat and do other things too. <clears throat> Some of these effects cannot be duplicated out in the real world. You've got to be aware of that. They seem to work with laboratory mice, but then if you try to duplicate it out in the real world with even wild mice, sometimes this doesn't work. So be aware of that. Now obviously some things do, but some things aren't repeatable out in the real world. So that's a little frustrating. Now I wrote down, okay, so this is like <clears throat> the Bruce effect. The unfamiliar male, right? What do they do? It's uh, the female basically aborts, right? Is one thing, mm -hmm. partner? Okay, and then also, doesn't it like, you didn't, did you say on your thing about it here, it can induce estrus in some animals? Yes. Okay, so that might be a secondary thing. And my triangle is my symbol. When in my, whenever I take notes, I don't have to write down estrus behavior. I just do a triangle like that. That means estrus behavior. It might induce <laughs> estrus. So there's a little overlap with some of these things. But the key is, it's an unfamiliar male, and it could be just urine soaked Betty, right? Remember that? The male doesn't have to be around. And that's what gets kind of hard about this because this stuff can travel in the air. And so if you're trying to do experiments, you've got to go, like, where is this air, air flowing? Is it going also to the room next door where we're not having the male exposure? You've got to be very careful about that. So that's the Bruce effect. Then the Coolidge. <clears throat> now, so, and that, I didn't look back at my notes on when, Monday. Some of this stuff may be brand new. This is, and I know we did this one. The male exhibits, uh, let's say, renewed interest in a 
I, I'll say a new female. Okay, and sometimes if you've ever been to, and maybe not a lot of you have done this, they use this kind of effect a little bit where they collect bulls for AI, the semen. How, how many have actually been there in the room where they're doing that? Anybody? One person. What? So you have this large bull, 2,000 pound bull. He comes in. Did they use the artificial vagina technique usually? Uh, a little bit. We had an electro ejaculator. Okay, you had an electro ejaculator, so you didn't have the yeah. bull come up and mount. No, we didn't. Okay, okay it, yeah. So. so the better way, you only use an electro ejaculator, by the way, if the bull is not as lame or something, there's some problem because you don't get the, the best volume. But anyway, what they usually do is a bull comes in and mounts an animal. <coughs> Tell me what the mounting, the mounted animal is. Like it, it's a teaser, but what is the animal? Tell me, describe it. The animal that gets mounted. Because this always surprised me. It's not a cow in heat. It's a steer. They're trained to mount steers because steers are heavier bone, they're more able to um, stand this, and it's let, you know, less likely to get injured. And how many times can you find a, a cow in heat, right? So the thing is, they mount a steer, but here's the other thing they do. The next bull to be collected is in the same room. He's watching. And that's a little bit like the Coolidge effect, okay? I mean, kind of a renewed interest. Okay, Lee boot effect. Did we do this one Monday? Yes. Did we? Okay. So the Lee boot is <coughs> where you get an all-female group. That's right. I remember that now. All-female group. Then this, the ester cycles may be prolonged or uh, cease. So we'll do ester cycles. Stop or maybe prolong. Again, make sure you understand, like, especially for like the cow example, how can you tell if a cow is going through an ester cycle? You take blood samples, right? Just because they were in heat doesn't mean they ovulated, all that kind of stuff. But again, this is more uh, rodent. Okay, then Vandenberg, I remember we talked about him, Amy talked about him. And this was where early puberty was induced in, in rodents or in animals. And so uh, puberty induced. And so then it's also like the boar effect, right? And the bull effect. So Vandenberg, he did it in rodents first, but then somebody's I think I think Vandenberg was at North Carolina State University, if I remember right. And so maybe, I don't know if he was in the zoology department or biology department, but I can see an animal science person going, boy, I wonder if that works in swine or if I wonder if it works in uh, cattle. <clears throat> and so it does. And then, now what was my uh, question about the Vandenberg effect as far as boars? I said something about, gee, I wonder if the early experiments did something. And don't even call. <coughs> I wonder if they used a castrated male pig. Because I'm a little I'm a little worried about maybe it's just the introduction of this strange thing that doesn't isn't housed in your pen, right? So I wonder if they did that. And I'm not sure because the ideal experiment would be you have this, you may have to have more than one boar, but let's say you have four boars, they're smelly, they're old, but you'd have four barrels that were the same age, like even litter mates, and then you could see, because they probably did, but I'm not sure. Okay, then here's maybe one that we didn't do. Witten effect, I don't think we did this one. <clears throat> and this is where you can synchronize estrus with a male. So a male exposure would uh, synchronize. So I did spell that out, synchronize. Synchronous estrus. 
And I think this might be kind of like what they do with weaned sows and weaned cows. Anybody familiar with that? Where you would wean them all at the same time and then do bore checking twice a day? They tend to, the, the sows tend to synchronize and you come, they come into estrus in a similar manner. Okay, anybody have any questions on that? Okay, then going back to this thing and let me shut this off for a second. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Okay, so now we've got two dogs getting petted and I've got to take a picture of that. Perfect. This is why we do this. Okay, so here we are. Let's talk about the prepucial gland, because I've kind of alluded to it. <coughs> and I'll use the smelly boar as an example. This is kind of where the smegma collects. Remember smegma we talked about, I remember it was Monday the last week. Smegma and what is it, Alyssa's gonna bring me some beans, hopefully sometimes, or if anybody, and then of course you bring them in a Ziploc bag. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> So if anybody wants to bring beans sometimes, go ahead, feel free. But these are glands, and I've got a picture of one, like where the penis is housed in the sheath, the end of the penis, almost coming out of the sheath, there's usually a sac there, or a gland, it's called the prepucial gland, and everything collects in there, and that's thought of where some of this, uh, the pheromones come from. So then, so that's prepucial gland. It's where smegma collects, pheromones are being produced, and then I've got this picture of a boar. Of course, this is cranial, this is caudal, and one thing you should note, in the bull and the boar, the penis has this sigmoid flexure and that's how it gets extended. Muscles contract and the penis is actually, you know, forced out the sheath here. And see this little area here, this prepucial diverticulum, sometimes it's called. It's an area where urine collects, semen collects, bacteria. It's a very uh, great place to make odors. And then the boars are famous for <coughs> urinating and spreading that stuff out. Okay. So then, what's my next picture? Okay, oh, I know, yeah. I was gonna say, what did I have this here for? I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I think it's on the next slide, because it's like a little sidebar. It's kind of humorous, by the way. This guy thinks it's funny, too. Um, the boars, relatively speaking, have a very large testicular mass compared to their body size, right? I mean, a bull, a 2,000 pound bull wouldn't have quite those big intestines. And not many people can take those out. And I wanted to show you how I would do it. I've just got a little sidebar here. So, because I've castrated boars that large. It's not fun, but it, you know, you have to do it sometimes. Um, what you do is you put a little, and I've got actually a picture of myself at Nebraska, so it's kind of interesting. On the ear vein, oops, sorry. Okay. Oops, sorry. Uh oh, bad. My bad. Wow, I learned something new. Yeah. No, no, here it is, over there. There it is, right there. Okay. Anyway, you put a little butterfly in their ear, and there's always this nice vein on these big bores. And what you do is you use a little 70% ethanol, which is a good disinfectant. And you tap the ear like that, and that little vein pops up, and you slide that little needle into the vein. Of course, somebody's holding the pig by a snout catcher. And then you give it to effect, and what I've used in the past was that stuff they found in the dog food. What was the drug that was found in the dog food? Pentobarbital, okay? I mean, it was not the pentobarbital that I showed you in the bottle. Okay, sorry, Grace, come over here. Uh, my bad. Anyway, so then, when I take the testes out, that spermatic cord is bigger than my thumb. So you have all these blood vessels 
in a device, in a structure that's bigger than my thumb. So there's really no suture that you could tie that off with because, you know, suture could bind through there. So I always use, what's that stuff right there? What's that called right up here on the screen? Anybody? We call it suture, but it's, we're not oh, it suture. No, I'm not calling it suture because when you look it up, you wouldn't, I mean, I guess in one sense you could call it suture, but there's a better it's name. Called large animal suture. Large animal. Right, right, right. It's actually umbilical tape is the better name for it. Anyway, it's very strong, and you can just tighten that big blood vessel. I mean, you know, there's multiple vessels in there, and I actually would do top two ligations and then cut the testes out. And I think the next picture has a picture of me doing this. This is me when I was your age. Amazing. Look at that guts. Look at that. <laughs> I wish I had that now, sorry. <laughs> and the reason I'm showing you this is because I've got a little sidebar on this place, if you ever hear about it. It's in the middle of Nebraska. It's on 35,000 acres. There's my syringe that's connected to the ear, right? You, you have a long tube, and so you can do that. My assistant took the picture, but you know, you'd always have an assistant here. Anyway, that's probably a 200 pound bore, and I'm just doing one side, but I would make two incisions, one over where the testis was on the left and one on the right, and then tie that off, anyway. But when I was thinking about this place last night, this is how these stories happen, I ran into some derogatory stuff at, about this place. And I was like a little shocked and defensive. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the place and tell you that when I was there, like this is a couple years ago, some, there was some bad press about maybe some experiment. When I was there, I can vouch for everybody was really good with animals and there was no cruelty or anything. But you know how when you do animal research, you can always take a picture out of context, right? Um, so something happened a couple years ago. Anyway, this place is called the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center. It's on 35,000 acres in the middle of Nebraska, and nobody can live there. Nobody can hunt, and the pheasant know it. You would drive to work, and there'd be 20 pheasant fly over your car because they can't be hunted out there. And they do cattle. They would actually hire cowboys. There'd be for job listings, cowboy, ride the horse, help with calving. They did cattle, sheep, and swine, and that's all they did. Here is an aerial view. It's kind of blurry, and I, this I just got off the internet. This is south, this is north, and the town of Clay Center is off this way, if you're familiar with Nebraska, and Hastings is over here. This is building one. When the government builds buildings at a place, they always number them. And here's how they number them, it's really freaky. They number them by how they were planned. Okay, so you plan building one and build it. The next building you build is number two, then you build it. And I was out there and like somebody, I was looking at like an overall map and there was like building nine and then building 11. And then I asked somebody, where's building 10? There is no building 10. So then. Why didn't you use 10? Well, here's the rule. If you plan a building, you number it, but if it never gets built, you don't use the number. So there was a building nine and a building 11. 10 was planned, but it was never built. Okay, so then, this is the closer of the, this is like a side view of that building one. And I remember my lab was back in over around the corner back here, and I shared it with a graduate student who was from Oregon. And then, It's on 35,000 acres, and here's a little history, because this is so interesting, and if you ever get out there, look at this. This is like a mound of dirt. You can, if I blow it up, you can see the cattle on top, right, or on the side. During World War II, there were no cattle out there. It wasn't even owned by the USDA. In World War II, the whole place stored munitions for the Navy the Navy stored munitions, and they would put them in these buildings, it was, it was cement, but then they put it in dirt, 
And then this is a blast wall because there's a, there's a door here and if that blew up, the blast would come out, hit here and go up because in front of it, there's another building. So then during World War II, planes would bring in munitions because they figured if they stored the munitions around the coast, the enemy might destroy all your ammunition and that would be terrible. So in the middle of Nebraska, there was, they stored these. And sometimes there'd be accidents where these would blow up because, you know, it's kind of delicate stuff. But anyway, now the cattle, and sometimes the cattle will be on top of it. It'll be kind of funny, like it's not uh, very safe. Okay, now this is a little introduction to the next topic. So now we're done with pheromones, okay, in a sense. So the rest of today and Monday, I want to talk about the next reading, the cohorts. Remember? And let me just remind you where that's at. And there's the cat stuff. That's right. I guess I got to talk about the cat stuff too. Okay. So, and I said this Monday, I remember. We're going to go down through here. Did this thing work finally? Yeah. Okay. So, down through cohorts. Back to my picture. Is that what the exams could be? Yeah. Down through, including. Yes. Okay, where am I at here? Here it is. Okay, now, here's what I want to talk about. One of the things we're going to talk about is called intrauterine position effects. <laughs> Interuteral, intrauterine position effects. This is in litter bearing animals where your neighbor might influence you. It ends up being usually always the case male fetuses will influence female fetuses. Do you think that happens in dogs? I don't know. And I'm not I have a female dog that's very... Okay, and we'll, like, we'll talk about it. And you know, I would not doubt not it. My dog, but, my hair is but it's hard to do research on it. But we'll talk about it. But to understand this, one of the measurements they do in these rodents is the anal genital distance. And that's A-N-O-G-E-N-I-T-A-L. The anal genital distance. <clears throat> and what it is, these dogs are being so great. Why don't we just spend the whole day together? Huh? <laughs> um, there's the anus on this rodent. And this happens to be a male. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and here's where the penis comes out. That's the sheath where the penis comes out. And the, that distance. <laughs> That distance is called the anal <laughs> genital distance. We're having entertainment here. Okay. And here it is. The anal genital distance is longer in the male than in the female. And also when I was at Nebraska, this was at, that place was away from Lincoln, but when I was at Lincoln, I had to sex day-old male rats. Uh, day-old male and female rats. So the distance is longer in the male, shorter in the female. And when we talk about these effects in utero, which have been documented in mice and rats and pigs, but dogs would, would be interesting to know it. And here's just another view. That's another, you know, it's not the true animal but the, the, my point is, the female is shorter, the male is longer. Remember that. That's hard to remember. Did he, she hit her head? No. She, she, stepped stepped on it. It. she did what? She, she stepped, stepped on it and pushed it. Oh, okay, that's not a problem. Okay, so here's, here's another example. Buck versus the doe. Female versus male. Okay, so now I need to go here. And this, there's that thing called the intrauterine position effects. And I'm just going to introduce a little bit, and then I've got to do my cat thing while I've got it here. So look at Vandenberg. There he is. Very famous, right? That's that, I think it's the, yeah, it's Vandenberg. That's John there. Very famous. And I'll just introduce a picture, and then this is part of your reading. But here's what happens. This is a... <coughs> 
<coughs> rat, mouse, or pig uterus. Okay? Doesn't really matter what. When you have a litter, you're going to have some males and some females. And here's the kicker. Every embryo starts out as a female. Female is a default sex. Every embryo has got the instructions, be a female. And the only thing that, that can change that is testosterone. If testosterone is released, then that fetus will become a male. Okay? So then, you've got this testosterone around, and if there's only one fetus, there's no problem, right? It's not, you know, it's not gonna affect your neighbor. But if you've got neighbors, the testosterone may affect the females. So then, in this example, <clears throat> they've got like this symbol, this uh, symbolized. There's a female there, there's a male. And then, uh, here's a female. Uh, sorry, male, and over here. So I want to look at this side, the female side first. This female is surrounded by males, right? Therefore, <laughs> okay, and there's so much fun. <laughs> this male, this female is called a two male female. So you put 2M and then you write female. And what does that mean? It means that that female was surrounded by two males. If there's only one male, then it'd be a one male female. And then what would you say if there were no males by her? A zero male female. So there's, for every female, you can have zero male female, one male female, or a two male female. And the two male female gets the most testosterone, okay? And probably the zero male female probably doesn't get any, because I think it's got to be kind of very close, okay? Now, I'm going to stop there, but I want to talk about this cat thing. So we're going to come back to that Monday. Let me tell you about the cat thing. I didn't realize this, but years ago, somebody did a study, and they said cats, if you have cats in your family, it can cause mental illness in your children. What? Yeah, exactly. And well, what is exactly like right. what? So then, somebody did a study in England, and that's what came out today. The, their study showed that there is no mental illness linked to having cats in your <coughs> home. And here's what they're thinking about. They're thinking about this word, write that down, toxoplasmosis. Ethan, did you make any questions on that in our, the parasite quiz? I can't remember. Okay. Toxoplasmosis. So house cats are known to be this host for this uh, T. Gandhi. Okay? And... They were thinking that if children got this parasite, it was going to be linked to mental illness. And so they did a study, <clears throat> and for, maybe I should go back here. Uh, toxoplasmosis can be, uh, you can get it through meat, but it, feces, or not, sorry, the, the feces of cat, and there's a whole, there's the organism right there. Because cats are the primary host of toxoplasma, Gone die. Okay? Now, see where it says primary host? In some parasite books, they would write down definitive host. So make sure you write down definitive host equals primary host. It's like it must be passing through a cat. Okay. So they were linking, I mean, look at this, you cat lovers out there, look at, they were linking schizophrenia to having cats in your house. <clears throat> And so anyway, they did a new study, 5,000 people, and they followed them, you know, um, who were born between 1991 and 92, and then they followed them through the age of 18, and they did, of course, some tests. Okay, the message for cat owners is clear. There's no evidence that cats pose a risk to children's mental health. That's the bottom line right there, okay? 
Grace, you're just such a good, you pay more attention. That's pretty good. Okay. She's reading. She's, like, she's, <laughs> she's she reading might. it. That's what it is. Now, here it is. There is a risk to pregnant women, though, with cat litter. So make sure you understand that. It's that same organism. And so for pregnant women, it can affect the fetus, the unborn. So you're supposed to wear gloves. Uh, if you're out in the garden, you're not supposed to do the litter box. Shannon first. It's the same with immunosuppressed people. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Pregnant women slash immunosuppressed individuals. Yes, the same thing. Good, thank you. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard recently from people that were like talking about it. I guess their doctors were saying if they've been exposed to it previously, like before they got pregnant, like if they had cats, then they shouldn't have to worry about it as much as if they were exposed. Right. They pre well, see, part Either of your... It's like a precaution, no, regardless, but right. it's the, there's like a really small chance of you actually yeah. getting it if you've it, already been exposed. Yeah, the kicker is you don't know really if you've ever been exposed. Because there are there's part of your immune system can work on that parasite. But the key is you just wear gloves and don't do the cat litter. The thing is, even out in the garden, you might say, I don't have any cats. I can just work in the soil around the house? No, you can't. Why? Because the, f the stray cats come by and use that as a litter box, right? So cats are always defecating all over. So the kicker is <laughs> mental illness not caused by this parasite, but pregnant women and immunocompromised people should not do the cat litter. That's the bottom line. Okay, I'm going to end there. See you Monday. We're going to finish up with the intrauterine position effect. You're going to read it. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about morphometric techniques and these puppies